This presentation is on pre-romanticism. We'll talk more about what that term means in a moment. Um, we're going to look at the poetry of uh, James Thompson, uh, Thomas Gray, and William Cooper in this presentation. So let's get started here. We have a lot to cover. I'll start by talking about this concept, pre-romanticism. Uh, during this, during the middle of the 18th century, there is a shift in English poetry away from the dominant Augustan forms of poetry, like the verse epistles and moral essays by Pope that we read, um, and away from from the the style of that poetry, the the, the kind of um, uh, with with its emphasis on on high level Latin addiction and and wittiness, and the subject matter of that poetry, a shift towards um, what I would describe as a more a affective poetic that utilizes more lyrical genres like the sonnet, the elegy, and the ode. And we'll talk specifically about elegies and odes later in this presentation. And I'll also explain what I mean by affective poetic. So there are three qualities to look for in the poetry of Thompson, Gray, and Cooper. And these qualities also existed to an extent in um, The Deserted Village by Oliver Goldsmith. Uh, and these qualities will become increasingly dominant towards the close of the 18th century. Um, and they will, in fact, become the foundation of, of a new literary movement called Romanticism. Uh, we're not going to cover any of the Romantic poets in this class. That's where um, uh, the British literature, too, picks up, starts with Romanticism at the end of the 18th century. Uh, but because the poets we're reading do not completely align with the priorities and practices of those romantic poets, particularly with regard to diction or, or the, the, the language of poetry, um, we're going to use the term pre-romantic to describe their work. And again, I'm going to put these three qualities up on the screen here, and um, uh, you should look for them as you're reading the poetry. So first is a turn to the natural world. The poets uh, that we're reading now turn away from moral didacticism uh, and satire, the idea that poetry should teach us good morals, uh, social grace and politesse and, and urbane humor. Um, these things would, would become increasingly the subject matter, the domain of the novel in the 18th century. Uh, so instead, the poets turn away from that. They turn away from the, the, the moral didacticism, didacticism um, social grace and politesse and urban humor, and look increasingly to the natural world for truths about life. These are poets who write about nature. They withdraw from human society with its temptations of ambition and luxury and prefer the solitude of nature, which allows for quiet introspection and the enjoyment of simpler pleasures. We see this with James Thompson uh, contemplating the sky on an autumn night, uh, and Thomas Gray standing on the banks of the River Thames contemplating his former school grounds, uh, Eaton College, or wandering in a graveyard. Um, and William Cooper, too, wandering the countryside with his caregiver, Mary Unwin, and we'll talk about that relationship when we get to Cooper's poetry. The next quality you should look for is what I call affective response. Um, so by immersing themselves in nature, these poets can explore the relationship between their sensory impressions and their emotions. And this goes back to John Locke's essay concerning human understanding. Uh, in the late 17th century, um, 1690. Unlike a previous generations of poets, the later 18th century poets are interested in sharing their feelings. Um, and they invite the reader into their emotional space in a way that we've never seen before in English poetry. 
uh, to form a connection with their readers. They see beauty in the natural world, and beauty is, is um, a key concept. Um, it's, it's a quality that's valuable in itself as a source of pleasure. So when you're reading these poets, look for words like please or admire, and especially the word delight. And sometimes if the impressions are strong enough, these poets feel a sense of transport or rapture or elevation, and sometimes even fear, which they describe as sublime. So these two concepts, beauty and sublimity, uh, are key to the affective response of these later 18th century poets. It's something you should, you should, you should look for. In addition, this relationship to the natural world strengthens these poets' connections with their fellow human beings. So they prefer the simple living and modest sociability found in rural communities amongst peasants and villagers away from the corrupting influences of commerce and power politics in the cities. And because these people live their lives in intimate contact with nature, they possess the quality of sensibility, the capacity to feel intensely, to be receptive and responsive to the feelings of other people. We see this with Goldsmith in The Deserted Village, and we see it with Gray musing over the graves of the rural poor in his poem Elegy written in a country churchyard. Finally, we're going to talk about, this is the third quality, imagination. Another word for it is, is fancy, an 18th century fancy word for imagination is fancy. Um, so the, the poets we're reading now are interested in how their mental faculties work, how they operate, not just the connection between their sensory perceptions of nature and their emotional states, but also how the mind is shaped by memory and life experience and how those memories and experiences can in turn shape our perceptions. So, for example, when Gray is looking um, at, the, at the grounds of Eton College, um, his view is at once enlivened by his childhood memories, his memories of playing and, and running with his friends, but it's also affected by his depressed state of mind after the death of his school friend, Richard West. These poets are also interested in the faculty of imagination in an unprecedented kind of way. Our capacity to build worlds and shape alternate realities in our minds. We see this when Gray imagines his own funeral in Elegy written in a country churchyard. It can be a pleasurable experience, as when Cooper describes himself meditating beside a fire on a winter evening, but it can also be painful, as in his description of Crazy Kate grieving after the loss of her lover at sea. So these are the three qualities to be looking for as you're reading these poets. And we're going to start by talking about James Thompson. He's the, the earliest of the three, um, born in 1700. Um, he is, his life does overlap with Thomas Gray, but all of his poetry uh, that we're going to be looking at uh, was published in, um, was, was first published in the 1720s. He, he worked on the seasons throughout his life, but the seasons was begun in the 1720s. So we'll start with a timeline here. He was born, he's a Scottish, Scottish uh, poet originally, born in the small village of Edmund in the Scottish borders region of Scotland. And in 1715, he, uh, he goes to Edinburgh and studies to become a Presbyterian minister like his father. And while he is there uh, studying um, uh, Latin and rhetoric and, and um, natural science, he joins a literary club and befriends a poet named David Mallet. And David Mallet would be um, Thompson's introduction to the literary world in London, and he would he would he would meet um, Alexander Pope, for example, 
Um, and while he's in London, starting in 1725, he, he works as a, uh, a tutor and then begins his literary career. And he does that publishing Winter, uh, the first of the four seasons. Uh, eventually, these poems would, would grow quite long. I think Winter started out as a poem of three or four hundred lines, and then these poems just grew and grew over the course of his life. This was followed by the poem Summer in 1727 and Spring in 1728. Um, and then finally in 1730, he publishes them all together as the seasons. Um, uh, the first poem, uh, or, or the first time Autumn appears, is in this uh, 1730 edition that includes all of the seasons. But he would continue to work on these poems uh, up to the end of his life. They went through many, many editions. From 1731 to 38, he composes some more poems, some plays, um, a poem called Liberty, uh, some moderately successful plays. He never really became famous as a playwright. Um, but it is notable that one of his plays, Edward and Eleonora, um, was among the first plays that was censored by these new stage, th this new stage licensing act that was um, enacted under the... the uh, the watchful legislative eye of Prime Minister Robert Walpole. Um, there was concern that the the that stage productions were getting away with too much, too much criticism of powerful people, too much criticism of government policy, and uh, the the old laws that um, were in place in the Renaissance uh, and throughout the 17th century were were. Um, uh, basically reinforced by this new licensing act, which would, would continue to exist in various forms over the next couple hundred years. In 1748, he publishes uh, The Castle of Indolence, and this is just a notable accomplishment because it was written in Spencerian stanzas, and this was very unfashionable at the time. This is this is the age of the of the heroic couplet, and these these long Spencerian stanzas were not popular. Uh, he dies unexpectedly after a brief illness in 1748. So we'll talk about the seasons. Again, I, I have their publication date here is from 1726 to 30, starting with winter in 1726, and then all of them being published together for the first time with autumn in 1730. But he continued to work on these poems throughout his life. It is his signature work. Um, he started it as a student of divinity in Edinburgh and continued revising it up to the end of his life. It was enormously popular in the 18th century. In fact, the poems of, of James Thompson, Thomas Gray, and William Cooper, all of them were extremely popular. Uh, poets that not many people know today, but uh, in their time were, were famous. Um, and the seasons remained continuously in print until well into the 19th century. And in fact, it was at the center of some, uh, a lot of the, the new copyright legislation that was developing um, in the 18th century. So at a time when the couplet reigned supreme and Pope, Alexander Pope was by far England's most popular poet, the seasons is remarkable for being written entirely in blank verse. And this was a form that would return to favor later later in the 18th century. Um, another poem we're gonna read um, that was written in blank verse is William Cooper's The Task. William Wordsworth would, would write his monumental work, The Prelude, in blank verse. Uh, but Thompson believed that while the couplet was appropriate for didactic poetry or, or poetry that teaches and social satire and light verse, that it was not appropriate, that it was it was just too artificial a form for his subject matter and his theme, which is, of course, nature. So that doesn't mean that he doesn't have 
some musical qualities in his poetry without the advantage of rhyme. He, he instead relies heavily on repeated sound patterns like alliteration, which, which is the repetition of similar sounds, usually initial consonants in a word, assonance, which is the repetition of stressed vowels, and consonants, the repeated stressed or terminal consonant, consonants of a word uh, to delight the ear. So alliteration, assonance, and consonants, these are all forms of sound repetition um, based on um, vowel or consonant sounds and whether those sounds are stressed in, um, in the metrical line. Like many poets of his generation, Thompson evinces nostalgia for the classical ideal of rural retreat as exemplified by Virgil's pastoral poetry. So for a time when poets sought uh, rustic comforts and avoided the temptations and corrupting influences of city life. What distinguishes Thompson's poetry from his contemporaries, however, even though it's, it's, it's based in this pastoral tradition, what distinguishes it is Thompson's sensorial immersion in the natural world. The first word of winter, the poem Winter, which was the first of the seasons to be published in order of composition, the first word is sea. And indeed, what readers most admired in the seasons was the novelty of Thompson's observations. At times, those observations are informed by advances in science, uh, especially Newton's work on, Sir Isaac Newton's work on optics in the late 17th century, and his ability to image forth the natural world in minute, picturesque detail. Now, I want to say a little bit more about the role of science here. Um, because it is, it is a factor in the excerpt that we're reading from the poem Autumn. His interest um, in um, Sir Isaac Newton um, was something that he developed as a college student, and Newton died while Thompson was composing the seasons. I think he died in, I, I might be wrong about this, but I think it was 1727. And he makes several references, direct references to Newton in the poems. Um, one aspect of our selection from Autumn that aligns Thompson with contemporary poets like Pope is, is his intolerance of superstition. So when you're reading Autumn, pay attention to his description of the Aurora Borealis, for example, and the contrast that he draws between those who view this, this natural phenomenon as an unknowable and terrifying mystery a sign of apocalypse or of impending doom, and those who view the Aurora Borealis scientifically, uh, having the knowledge of, of Sir Isaac Newton, how, how Isaac Newton was able to explain optical phenomena like the Aurora Borealis. So pay attention to that as you're reading. Another distinguishing feature of Thompson's poetry is his emphasis on personal experiences and emotions an effective response to nature, which I talked about earlier in the presentation. So thus, in the seasons, we don't hear the voice of the scornful satirist like Swift or of the sage philosopher like Pope, but rather a sensitive, contemplative, solitary individual who is not removed from but deeply receptive to the world around him, from the tiniest insects buzzing about his head to the clouds high above. For Thompson, nature both pleases and elevates the soul. And he shows the reader what can be learned from nature and how to live within its bounds as prescribed by God. Now the next poet we're going to read is Thomas Gray. He was born in 1716. He was born in London uh, to a Scrivener father, Philip Gray, and his mother, Dorothy. And he was only one of 12 children who would survive infancy. All of his other siblings died, and Gray himself was mortally ill as a baby, uh, managed to survive. I don't know the circumstances of all of their deaths, but it's, it's, it is suspicious. It's, very strange. Um, 
At eight years old, he is sent to Eton College, where his uncle was an assistant master, and there he makes some important friendships. Uh, Horace Walpole, the son of the prime minister, um, who had passed the stage licensing, who would pass the stage licensing act about a decade after this, and uh, an, an important friendship with Richard West. And there was there was another uh, young man that was a member of their group as well. From 1734 to 38, he studies at Cambridge, and this would later become his home. He eventually leaves the school without taking a degree, and he does that to uh, travel with his friend, Horace Walpole, whom you see there on the right in an absolutely awesome painting um, by Sir Joshua Reynolds. I love that portrait of Walpole. And he spent two years in France and Italy with Horace, um, but they had a falling out. Horace Walpole was course incredibly wealthy the son of the prime minister and he wanted to party and socialize and thomas gray wanted to spend time in libraries and museums and eventually their personalities just conflicted and thomas gray went home and felt kind of guilty because he'd been neglecting his friendship with richard west who shared his interest in writing poetry in 1742 he composes a poem called ode on the spring and this was in response to a poem that richard west had written and sent to him and then um, he sends off Ode on the Spring to his friend, and then it comes back in the mail as undeliverable. And he's like, well, that, that's strange. Um, unbeknownst to Thomas Gray, uh, Richard West had died just a few days before he sent the poem. Uh, he was sick with tuberculosis, which is a, a pulmonary disease that at the time was, was terminal. It was a death sentence if you caught it. Um, uh, Richard West was only 25 years old at the time, uh, and and Thomas Gray writes a sonnet um, about this, and, and he had learned of Richard West's death, not because anyone told him, but because he saw a, um, a eulogy, a poetic eulogy that had been published in a newspaper. He found it complete by accident that, his, that, that one of his best friends had died. Uh, he wrote a sonnet uh, commemorating his friend, um, and started writing um, his ode um, on Eton College at this time. He returns to Cambridge. Um, he's stunned by the loss of his friend. He returns to Cambridge, and he will stay there for much of the remainder of his life. Uh, after his uncle's death, his mother, now a widow, moves in with her sisters at the village of Stoke Poges, where he will spend a good deal of time during uh, the summer months. Ode, uh, pardon me, Ode on a Distant Prospect of Eton College was published by a man named Robert Dodsley. You see him there in the picture in 1747. Dodsley was um, an enormously influential publisher in the middle of the 18th century. He was uh, Samuel Johnson's publisher, um, one of the great scholars and writers of the 18th century, and Dodsley was quite pleased um, to have uh, Thomas Gray in his stable of poets. Um, and then in 1751, Dodsley published uh, the enormously popular elegy written in a country churchyard. Here is a view of Eton College, by the way. This is a, this is a painting by the landscape painter Canaletto. Um, that's the chapel of Eton College in the background there, and it still, still stands today, although now it's completely engulfed by um, the city of London. Uh, here it looks like it's out in the country. Um, that's the River Thames in the foreground, and this is the kind of view that Gray uh, was imagining when he wrote his ode on a distant prospect of Eton College. From 1758 to 71, uh, the rest of his life, he writes very little poetry after 1756 and lives, in fact, I, I, think, I think the total number of lines that he wrote numbers less than a thousand. So Thomas Gray's reputation, he's one of the great poets of, uh, of the period, um, but his reputation rests on just a scant number of, of poems. Uh, 
Uh, so that's testimony of just how, how highly regarded these poems were. Um, he lives the rest of his life as a recluse uh, and a scholar at Cambridge. He makes occasional excursions to Scotland and the Lake District in the north of England. Um, he does some research for a history of English poetry that he never finishes and dies of gout in 1771 and is buried beside his mother and his aunt in the churchyard of St. Giles in Stoke Poges. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. We'll start by talking just briefly about the Ode on a Distant Prospect of Eton College. That's a portrait of another poet named Sir Brooke Boothby. Although he did not write in blank verse like Thompson did, uh, Gray also eschewed the common practice of couplets and valorized the imagination and effective response over the rationalism and moral didacticism that had guided the earlier scribblerians like Pope and Swift. Thompson and de Grey uh, apply their poetic abilities to the description and contemplation of the natural world rather than to rational argument and the criticism of social manners, which is what we see in Pope and Swift. Their expressiveness, the expressiveness of Thompson and Gray, is distinguished by emotional intensity and a kind of sober sincerity rather than the cold, dazzling wit of the Augustan poets. Gray's Ode on a Distant Prospect of Eton College is an example of a form of poetry that, it's, it's not that it had not been used before, but it was becoming more common as later 18th century poets sought more lyrical modes of expression. Like most poetic forms adopted during this period, uh, the 18th century, the Ode is a form that was inherited from classical antiquity, namely the Greek poets, Horace and Pindar. And there are different kinds of odes, and we're not going to cover that in this course. But the purpose of the Ode is to praise or commemorate a specific person, a specific place, as in Eton College, uh, or, or a thing. Uh, Gray's Ode is dedicated to the school where he was educated from the age of eight until he matriculated at Cambridge in 1734. Readers should note the complex rhyme and verse pattern of the poem. This is a feature of all odes. They have really complicated rhyme and verse patterns and stanza patterns as well. Um, and you should pay special attention to the complex interplay in this poem between the poet's childhood memories and his current feelings about youth, about innocence, and the disappointments of life experience. Remember, his friend Richard West had died at the time he started writing this poem. Um, and he knew Richard West from his time at Eton College. So as you're reading, pay attention to that, that interplay, um, the contrast between the, the, the pleasant view he has of the college and, and his, his fraught feelings. Um, about where he was at this point in his life. The Elegy Written in a Country Churchyard, this is the companion poem to the Ode. Um, this is a view of, uh, we don't know if, if um, the churchyard you see in this, this painting um, is the churchyard he was thinking of when he wrote the Elegy, but um, this is the churchyard in St. Giles in Stoke Poges, Buckinghamshire, where Gray spent many summers with his mom, with his aunts, um, and eventually he was buried there when he died uh, 20 years after uh, publishing this poem. Uh, I love this picture of, of the uh, church of St. Giles there. Many of the features you see here still exist today. Um, here's a picture as it stands. Uh, so you'll notice that the steeple and the painting is gone and probably may have been struck by lightning and burned down. I don't know. Um, but the stone structure remains very much intact. And there have been some additions to the building um, and some of the uh, some additional stones, gravestones, grave markers have been added. But um, but it looks pretty much the same now as it, as it did then. 
Gray's Elegy was published by Dodsley in 1751, and it was his most famous poem at the time, an absolute overnight literary phenomenon. He continued to revise the poem after publication for a few years. He deleted some stanzas, and then he added some new ones, like the closing epitaph, which was not in the poem when it was originally published in 1751. The version we're looking at was printed in 1753, and it appeared in numerous editions throughout the decade and would become one of the best-known poems of the 18th century. It is an elegy, and an elegy is a lyric poem that expresses personal grief and loss. And like the ode, elegiac poetry dates back to uh, antiquity, and the Latin poets, Catullus, Propertius, and Ovid, were admired, much admired in the 18th century for their efforts in the genre of elegy. But it is Milton, John Milton's pastoral elegy, his poem Lycidas, uh, from 1638, that was the model for Thomas Gray. Um, and there are Miltonic allusions all over the place in the elegy and, and elsewhere in Gray's poetry, too. Gray was, was a big, big fan of John Milton. In contrast to the ode on Eton College, um, <laughs> Eton, um, it's spelled wrong there, that's funny. Um, Elegy has regular stanzas of iambic pentameter and a simple A-B-B-A -B -B rhyme scheme. So we'll move on now and talk about William Cooper. Probably the most tragic poet in the history of, of English poetry. Very, very, uh, very sad life as a portrait of him by great portrait painter George Romney. He was born uh, in Berkhamsted to John Cooper, who was a clergyman, and Mother Anne, who died in 1737 while, while William was, was still a young boy, and she died giving birth to his brother John, and the absence of a mother figure was, was a major, had a major impact on his life. He wrote about it later, and he, he later developed a relationship with a woman named Mary Unwin. We'll talk about her in a little bit, and she fulfilled uh, that role in many ways. His aunt and uncle on his mother's side uh, encouraged his love of literature and gave him things to read, like Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. And in 1742, he attends um, uh, Westminster School and studies the classics and masters classical languages in preparation for a career in law. And at this time, he, he meets some friends, and they have a magazine, and he publishes his first poems at this time. There are moral satires very much in the vein of early 18th century poems, like those of, of Pope, for example, or Arbuthnot. In 1763, after a failed courtship with his cousin, Theodora, and the coinciding stress of legal study, he suffers an intense bout of depression. Um, um, these, these, the, I, I don't know if they caused the depression or if they, if they triggered a condition that he already had, I would suspect the latter, but it's very severe. And he makes several suicide attempts by poisoning, tries to drown himself. He tries to hang himself. He tries all kinds of different ways to do it. Um, all unsuccessful. Um, and eventually he is committed to an asylum in St. Albans. When he is released from that asylum, He's, he's recovered, uh, and he settles with a retired clergyman named Morley Unwin and his wife Mary. Morley dies in a horse riding accident shortly after he uh, moves in with them, so that's not a good sign. Um, and they live in the town of Oni. Um, and they the, one of their neighbors in Oni was named John Newton, and um, uh, he was already a friend of the Unwins and um, became a friend of William Cooper. He has a, Newton had an extremely interesting life. He was a former slave trader. Um, he was himself enslaved at one point in Africa, um, but then converted to Christianity and became an ardent uh, opponent of the slave trade and abolitionist. And he would influence 
uh, Cooper's own uh, views on the slave trade and um, Cooper's abolitionist poetry that would be published later. At this time, he is working on writing hymns with John Newton that would be published um, in 1779. In 1773, he experiences a severe relapse of insanity and suicidal thoughts, and I don't know what the trigger was for this, um, but Mary, on one, nurses him back to health, um, but he's, de he's permanently debilitated uh, now. He believes that he's been damned and abandoned by God. He never attends church services again. Uh, he, he gives up prayer and turns for comfort instead to gardening and raising pets. This is on the left there. You see a stained glass window in the Church of St. Nicholas in Norfolk where Cooper is buried. And it's a beautiful window and it shows Cooper um, at his writing table um, reading something. I, I don't know, um, maybe, maybe reading maybe reading the Oni hymns. Um, and, and he's got some of his pets down there. He was particularly fond of his rabbits. And when he died, he would write um, little eulogies, uh, little threnodies on his, on his rabbits. In 1779, the Oni hymns are published, and the most famous of them is Amazing Grace by John Newton. Um, and it's, that's a hymn that we all know, and, and many of these hymns made it into American hymnals, uh, Protestant hymnals, um, in the 18th century and are still sung today. Uh, Mary encourages uh, Cooper to write poetry as a way to cope with his mental illness, and some of those poems would finally be published in 1782. But the big one, the most important of his poems, is The Task, which was published in 1785. He, he spent um, barely more than a year uh, working on it, so he worked on it quite feverishly. It's a long poem. It's in six books, um, over 5,000 lines. In 1787, um, there is an abolitionist group that forms called the Society for Effecting the Abolition of the Slave Trade. Very important group, very instrumental in helping to abolish the slave trade in England, um, although they would not be successful at doing so during Cooper's lifetime. And they ask Cooper to submit poems uh, supporting abolition. And uh, the most famous of these um, is The Negro's Complaint, which was published in 1788. And this is a poem that would be cited by um, abolitionists and even by American civil rights leaders in the 1960s. Martin Luther King loved this poem and cited it several times in his speeches. In 1791, uh, he publishes a new translation of Homer's Iliad and Odyssey. Uh, he saw this as as um, um, the corrective translation to Pope's, Alexander Pope's translations in couplets. Um, earlier in the century, um, he saw that as inappropriate and thought that blank verse was more appropriate to Homer's subject matter. Um, unfortunately for Cooper, uh, the translations are very good, and I, I, I think they're, they're quite good, but uh, they never really caught on, and Pope's translation remained quite popular well into the 19th century. In 1796, um, this is a, a dark period. Mary Unwin, his companion and his caregiver for, for many, many decades, dies, and this precipitates another severe bout of depression from which he, he never recovers, and he will die in 1800. The last poem um, that, that we were reading, and the last poem, in fact, in volume C of the Norton Anthology, is called The Castaway, where he, he explicitly compares himself to um, a sailor who had been washed overboard from his ship and drowned in the sea. Um, this was something that Cooper had read many, many years earlier and obviously was in his mind near the end of his life when he wrote that poem, The Castaway. He died in 1800. So the task is written in blank verse. Um, it was first published, like I said, in 1785. And in many ways, it epitomizes the features of pre-romantic poetry that we've already glimpsed in the poems of Goldsmith, Thompson, and Gray. Uh, 
uh, the poet's rejection of city life and his keen responsiveness to the natural world, his expression of heightened sensibility um, and, and pathos, and his introspection and self-examination and attentiveness to the workings of his own mental faculties. All of these things are, are developed to an extraordinary degree in the task, even though we're not, we're not able to read all of it in this course. It is organized into six books, and, and I want to orient you a little bit because the Norton excerpts several of these books. Um, the first one is called The Sofa, and it's an interesting title. Um, a friend of Cooper's named Lady Austin was visiting him and Mary Unwin, and when Cooper complained that he felt no motivation to write, now remember he's, he's you know, deeply depressed, uh, mentally ill at this point, she suggested, uh, Lady Austin suggested that he write something in the style of Milton, one of her favorite poets, in blank verse. Um, Cooper balked at the suggestion, said he didn't have a subject to write about, and she jokingly suggested that he write about the couch, the sofa, and he took her seriously, which is why the first book is titled The Sofa. Uh, the poem is non-narrative, the task, this non-narrative poem, and it ranges discursively over a variety of different topics. Uh, it's not linear. Whatever came to Cooper's mind as he went about his daily tasks of walking or gardening or feeding his rabbits or sitting by the fire late at night, um, the, the poem just kind of wander or, or follows the wanderings of his own thoughts and interests. In book one, the sofa starts with the history of the sofa's evolution from a simple stool of the ancient world into the cushioned and upholstered convenience of modern times. And there's there's a mock tone to it, kind of mock heroic tone to it, but it gets more serious from there. And he describes his walks in the countryside. He contrasts rural life versus life in the city. He expresses his opposition to luxury and wealth and his preference for simple pleasures found in the country. And he talks about how rustic life promotes sociability and virtue, um, much as uh, Oliver Goldsmith did. And we know how we know how, how Crabbe felt about that idealism. And he talks about the, the pressures of city life um, leading to corruption. Book two is called The Timepiece. Um, this, this one is famous because it contains one of his attacks on the institution of slavery, and he goes into great detail about um, why he believed Great Britain was in a state of moral decline. Book three was titled The Garden, and he describes his gardening activities and extols the simple pleasures of rustic life. Book four is The Winter Evening, which contains a wonderful excerpt, and we have a wonderful excerpt from this in um, the Norton, where he spends most of his time uh, describing the domestic comforts of rural life, like sitting by a fire on a snowy night. In book five, the, the, the Winter Morning Walk, this is the most political of the six books. He talks about, about war and tyranny and liberty. This was the period of revolution. There was the, the American Revolution um, had... Um, uh, just been decided at the time that he was writing uh, the task, and um, things were beginning to, to get unsettled in uh, uh, France during this period. Um, book six, The Winter Walk at Noon, he discusses his love of animals and offers a rapturous vision of heaven, a place that he thought he would never be admitted. He believed he was going to hell. So that concludes this presentation on uh, pre-romanticism. That photograph of Gray's monument is going to fade out there into this uh, 19th century drawing of the churchyard of St. Giles at Stoke Poges. That monument to Gray that you see there has some lines from uh, uh, the elegy written in those um, entablatures on the, the sides of the monument. And um, there's a good video of it. I'll post the video um, on D2L for you all to watch. And that concludes the presentation.